so many things, fruits and everything, and then suddenly says swaha. About this swaha, there is a good joke. So there was this marriage ceremony going on. And you know, Indian marriage ceremonies are not very, uh, I, I see in Hollywood, see they show all these marriage ceremonies, you just exchange the ring and then uh, they were, that's all, very happy. And then say, will you be in this life? Do you agree? Yes, we agree. And that's all. And that is finished. Finish. Bahut simple. It's finished. And that's why probably they again come back for the divorce because that's so simple. But no. But in Indian marriage ceremony, it can become very tough. Now, this ceremony before that you have to do this, and after that you have to do this. And in some communities, it can become very, very tough. So the ceremony rituals are going on for 12 hours and 13 hours, and the worst part is you can't take any food. So you have to do for us. Because you see, because you have to get the mental strength to face the difficult marriage life. So that is why they have done that. So what happened is, once this wedding was taking place, so this bride and bridegroom, for understandable reasons, they have got up at 3.30 in the morning and nothing to eat. So they were very hungry. So this Pandit ji told, Acha laddu usme dali hai, in the Havan Kund, and tell Swaha. So the bridegroom couldn't contain himself. He said, he took the laddu, all right, put it in his mouth and said, aha. So, <laughs> so that's what, you know, that is the idea we get when we talk about sacrifice. Swaha, something I have to offer. True, sacrifice means that, something like that, you have to offer. But this is essentially the Vedic concept of sacrifice. The Vedic sacrifice. And Vedic sacrifice, more often than not, were done for attaining some particular purpose, like this Putra Kameshti Yajna. Even today, in certain parts of India, they follow this Putra Kameshti Yajna in full detail. Many years back, this Yajna was done in, on a large scale in Kerala. Then they do all these kinds of Yajna and they say that if you do this Yajna, you will be, uh, there will be a birth of sun. And, uh, there are a lot of historians who will tell you that Putra means sun. And that is why we had to take up a study of the Vedas using some historians and to find out or to establish that Putra does not mean sun. It was in the later, later Vedic period, I am digressing now, but it was in the later, later Vedic period that Putra came to mean sun. But Putra essentially, originally did not mean sun, it just meant offspring. So there is a lot of gender issues here. So, this is what the idea you get when you say Yajna. But Yajna, as it comes in Bhagavad Gita, does not mean that. Yajna means, there are various types of Yajnas. There is a sacrifice which you offer to gods. And that kind of sacrifice, whether you offer or whether it reaches God, God only knows. So, that is the sacrifice you offer to gods. Then there is a sacrifice which you offer to Pitru, which in English is called manes. Your ancestor who have departed, who are no more in this world. These two sacrifices nobody can understand because nobody has seen. So you can say I offer everything and nobody will know. But like you give prasada to Bhagavan, like you, you do the Naivedya thing, you offer the uh, food. And the more rich the food, the more good your prasad. So afterwards you are only going to eat it. So that is a very convenient offering. But the other offerings, those two offerings are expenses. So very few people do these two offerings. One is to other beings. Offering to other beings. So there are a lot of people who are fans of Hanuman. And in Delhi, Mathura, Vrindavan, these areas, there are a lot of people who will bring cart loads of puris, bhajis and all that and give to monkeys. There will be beggars in front of them who have not taken food for many days but they will not get that. They will give it to monkeys because if you please Hanuman, you please Rama and you get so many things. So that is the kind of sacrifice. And there is uh, so many people, they give food to pigeons and you know so many things. Delhi six, you have so many pigeons and you give food to pigeons. And then you have sacrifice to human beings, not sacrifice of human beings, sacrifice to human beings. 
So sacrifice to human beings, you have to give some kind of return. Now what is this all about? It's a cosmic cycle. Actually, I have received sacrifice from these people. First of all, God has done a great sacrifice in sending me down to this world. But actually, God is thinking other way. He is telling Baba, Bajgya. <laughs> but anyway, we can just for thinking, we can think that God has done a great sacrifice. Then the ancestors, they have done a lot of sacrifice. The other beings are doing a lot of sacrifice. You don't believe it? Go to a jungle and sit in front of a tiger. Great sacrifice. Because the tiger is not eating you. Otherwise, the tiger will eat you. Snake is not coming and biting you. Great sacrifice. So, positive sacrifice, negative sacrifice. By not doing anything also they are sacrificing. Human beings sacrifice. You have come to this institution because many people couldn't come. Because you have come, many people couldn't come. So, that is also a sacrifice. Sacrifice can be at various levels. We never think that way. So, because we owe our life and position in the society, because of the sacrifice of so many creatures, it's only logical that we give back to them. And that is what is all about. Now, this is the Vedic sacrifice. I don't know how many of you have actually witnessed a Vedic sacrifice. How many? Vedic sacrifice. Have which sacrifice? Do you remember the name? Where? Arya Samaj does a lot of such sacrifices. So, Yajna. So, this is they follow the Vedic texts and use lot of material which are prescribed in the Vedic texts and rice balls and so many other things. And then the, the Havan Kund is also made according to precise measurement which are also given in the Vedas. So, this is one sacrifice. Then this is the sacrifice which is done in many places. Pinda. You give Pinda. Now, why I am showing you this? Because jokes apart, whatever about ancestors or gods, these sacrifices have a meaning. And there are incidents, true life incidents, where actually these sacrifices had a meaning. Like if you go to Gaya, there will be lots and lots of people who will come and tell you stories of how actually their departed some grandparents or somebody came and accepted their sacrifice. Little spooky and eh? ghost thing. But actually it happens. So we don't know. We don't have explanation to many things. So let us just leave it at that. This is how a typical sacrifice, Pinda Dana is done. You see this, every uh, those groups of rice with that ball on top of that is given to the ancestors and before taking sannyasa vo even we monks have to do this pindadana or shraddha what they call and we do the pindadana to ourselves like we have done our own shraddha in bengali this word has got a different meaning shraddha so it has got another meaning also those who know bengali know that so this we do that for people for our parents who are alive we do this shraddha so that is we have fulfilled the duty which we will not be able to do because once you take sannyasa, you can't do these rites. So it seems if you give this and they are accompanied with so many meaningful mantras, it seems you do this and those departed ancestors are freed and they can go to other worlds and all that. That is the belief. Then you have this sacrifice. Now, every sacrifice has got a Sanskrit meaning, a Sanskrit word. The first one, sacrifice to gods, is called as Deva Yajna. Second one, sacrifice to your departed ancestors, means is called Pitri Yajna. And sacrifice to other beings like this. This is a very common site. It's called Ri Yajna. And sacrifice to human beings is called uh, sorry, sacrifice to other, this thing is called Bhuta Yajna and this is called Nri Yajna. Now, this kind of giving some food, some clothing or some medical help or some intellectual help. I know of many students who conduct computer mm -hmm. classes when they are free and all that. So, this kind of sacrifice. Why do we need to do all these things? Because, you know, this is the cycle. As a human being, we receive 
labor knowledge and spiritual food knowledge and spirituality from the world we receive this food knowledge and spirituality and to the extent we can give we should give it back to the universe labor knowledge and spirituality so what what will happen if we don't why should we give back Swami Vivekananda used to say one thing if if you do not if you don't tire you will like if you don't wear out you will rust out this is what he used to say if you do not wear out you will rust out you purchase some machinery and you don't use it it will anyway become useless after 3 years similarly if you are not going to give it back to the universe the universe will take it from you how diabetes or some other disease you will not be able to eat anything after some time so that always happens this is a law of conservation of the universe it always happens so that is why our ancestors in every world tradition had the system of sacrifice giving back to the universe there are a lot of examples anyway it's more on a devotional side but i will tell you there are a lot of examples in the mythology indian mythology about this shabari's example is the classical one and in down south there is the example of andal where she puts on the flower garland and sees in the mirror whether she looks uh, beautiful and then she gives it to his uh, her father to be given to lord vishnu so you see this is all then in puja there is a phrase called devo bhutva devam yajet you become god and you you worship god that is why you have to purify yourself the place where you sit etc this is the ritual aspect of it why do we do that because unless you purify yourself you go to the same kind of level of god and they do that so if you think that it is something i am giving like if there was a child and you were offering the child something you will eat yourself and then give it to the child so it can be done there is no problem it all depends on what you think now the daniel gilbert i was talking about his ted talk we can see that is if any one of you is interested to see can see it's a small ted talks usually are very small and they bring very innovative ideas has anybody seen this already no so up to which slide your happiness also will be a dream yeah so when it breaks happiness will go you have the answer yourself so we are not looking for some fake happiness that's why i said not synthetic happiness we want real happiness the solution is to be content with whatever we have he uses the word synthetic happiness because probably he is not schooled in that kind of thought or he doesn't want to think that but probably he believes that there's a better kind of happiness but you can't have any better kind of happiness you can't want everything in life and if you do then you will not have peace you can choose only one either this is a stock objection to this thing but there is a very simple observation which i would like to make how many people are there like this or how many of you how many such people did you see in your life even one so it's more a hypothetical question so let us leave it at that yeah true that is why when somebody is god realized or somebody has attained the knowledge of god that person doesn't want anything 
say Ramakrishna or Ramana Maharshi, not bothered. So he was not interested in the growth of science or what will happen to uh, physics or something like that. He was not interested. He never told Vivekananda to in uh, what you call develop science. Or for that matter, huh? Like, uh, it is not whatever shikha. It is spiritual education. That is different. He wanted everyone, he wanted everyone to become self-contented. He wanted that teaching to be given. No, it is not exactly, it is not uh, the same kind of performance. You see, it's, I, there is a difference. A self-contented person, that is, Sri Ramakrishna says, that he may teach for the welfare of the world, like Shankaracharya did. But that kind of teaching and a scientist teaching, they are different. So that kind of performance and this performance, there is a difference. So materialistic means you find something and non-materialistic is what is Brahma, nobody knows. So <laughs> yeah, my question is, anything we do, we just do, we do it because we have certain motivation for it. Now, Western means any thought and all that, unless there is a particular motivation, a strong motivation, it will ultimately become into a knowledge or insight. No, no, we always do this. We always restrain our self, uh, sense organs. For example, if you have to concentrate here, you will have to uh, at least keep your mobiles in a silent mode. We always do that. Only thing we are not conscious about that. Suppose we are watching a movie, we are not aware of the other sounds, are we? We are not aware. Somebody would come and stand in front of us and call us. We are not aware because we are talking on phone. We always do this. Only thing is we don't do it willingly, knowingly. If we do it willingly, then we can achieve a lot. See, it's not that your senses are always running, no. <laughs> That's why somebody says, I, I'm calling you for the last two minutes and you're not hearing at all. Why does that happen? Because you get focused automatically, because something is more attractive than this call. automatically gross uh, sense pleasures are more attractive. So if you want to reach to the level of say Hindustani music, then you have to have some kind of self-restraint. Otherwise you will never be able to understand or appreciate Hindustani music. So that self-restraint has to be inculcated because always food will be more attractive than Hindustani music, some sare, some, some raga and all that. But the nature of the thing is difficult when this is much gross and that is very fine. At present, I mean our mind is occupied all the time with uh, either sense organs or thoughts which are consequences of sense input. Hmm. So if I completely restrain my senses, what do I occupy myself, my mind with? No, this is the same, same answer like that. Uh, young woman asked the same question. How many people did you actually meet who completely restrain their sensor? So it's an hypothetical so question. In the beginning you said that like uh, when I want to do mathematics, huh. topology, hmm. uh, I just forget about everything else. Yeah. So now what do I want to do that I should restrain my... Uh, I mean, you have to find for yourself. No? I should have something else. We have to put I mean, some other thing in front of us, right? So that we can... No, that goal, that goal everyone has to find because this goal cannot be same for everyone. I may have the goal as God realization, you can't have the same thing. That goal cannot be a universal goal. That goal has to be, say for example, let me give you a very gross example, Amir Khan. Now this fellow has suddenly got an idea that he will make movies which are offbeat. He does that and he does it wonderfully. And he is concentrating his whole thing on that. Wonderful. So similarly, Rashid Khan, he is concentrating everything on Hindustani classical music. Wonderful. He is doing that. And it is not true that young people can't do that. Like there is a tabla player called, uh, what is his name? His, his son, Arif. He is very young. 
but he's a wonderful tabla player. Jakir. Not Jakir. He's a very famous one, Khan. And his uh, ah, Keramutala Khan Saab's granddaughter, grandson, grandson. So Shabir Khan, Shabir Khan's son. So now this fellow is very young, and all he eats is chocolate and cold drinks. Uh, but he is a wonderful tabla player. So if you concentrate, you can do it. And in fact, to excel in any field, you have to concentrate. You have to concentrate. Otherwise, it's not possible. Simply not possible. Even if it is a terrorism thing, you have to concentrate. Think of these people, all these uh, um, uh, Bin Laden and all this. They have done nothing else in their life, but only terrorism. Terrorize people, you know. It's complete concentration. So, I don't mean to say that we have to become terrorists, but what I am telling is, good or bad, we have to concentrate. Else we don't achieve results. And what you will concentrate on, that depends on you. That, of course, you have to decide. But you have to have a blueprint for your life, otherwise it is difficult. We will... Shall we see that uh, film? Yeah. The I think the other, other VLC, VLC, uh, huh? Yes. Din, din, din. Uh, Open desktop file. Din, din. Din, din. So just give it a moment of thought. You 
They probably don't feel like they need a moment of thought. And interestingly, there are data on these two groups of people, data on how happy they are. And this is exactly what you expected, isn't it? But these aren't the data. I made these up. These are the data. You failed the pop quiz, and you're hardly five minutes into the lecture. Because the fact is that a year after losing the use of their legs, and a year after winning the lotto, lottery winners and paraplegics are equally happy with their lives. You know, don't feel too bad about failing the first pop quiz, because everybody fails all the pop quizzes all of the time. The research that my laboratory has been doing, that economists and psychologists around the country have been doing, 